Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I want to start off by saying that the theorem I want to state is work in progress, but I wanted to state the work in progress because the part that's more complete is a proof of mirror symmetry in a new case. And I just don't want to put an A infinity category on the board within the first 10 seconds, because that seems a bit antisocial. So what are we going to try to study? So we've already had a few talks about this. Uh, X is going to be a symplectic manifold dimension 2n, which remember means it has a closed two-form omega whose top exterior power is nowhere vanishing. And we're going to study a similar object to what appeared in Sopan's talk diffeomorphisms from X to itself that preserve the symplectic form. So this is a topological group. And I'm going to denote the symplectic mapping class group like this. I'm going to call it ORT just because that's the main thing we'll end up talking about. Uh, that's a subtle question, but uh, well, um, if I assume that, the, that H1 of X with real coefficients vanishes, then uh, we might as well take the, the C infinity topology on here. Um, Oh, and I'm going to in introduce one more uh, the symplectic Torelli group, the subgroup of the symplectic mapping class group that acts trivially on cohomology. So Uh, what do these look like? Well, when n equals 1, there's actually nothing symplectic going on. This group is homotopy equivalent to orientation preserving diffeomorphisms of x. So very interesting and well-studied object but not one that has any specifically symplectic content. And so we're going to, we're going to go to the next dimension, uh, four, four real dimensional symplectic manifolds, and that's where the, next, the rest of the talk is going to happen. So Gromov really uh, got the study of these symplectic mapping class groups off the ground with his introduc introduction of uh, holomorphic curve techniques. Firstly, he proved the compact symplectic mapping class group of R4 with the standard symplectic form is contractible. And so in the analogous question about smooth diffeomorphisms is the compact smooth mapping class group of R4 is, uh, is unknown. So it's symplectic things we know much more about than the smooth things, as it turns out. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, all right, so we have that one. If we take the Fubini study form on CP2, Gromov also proved that this is homotopy equivalent to PU3. It's a perfectly reasonable answer. If we have CP1 cross CP1 with a, direct, with a direct sum of symplectic forms of the same area on the two factors, we also get a perfectly sensible answer. We get rotations on the first factor, cross rotations on the second factor, semi-direct product with the involution that swaps the two factors. On the other hand, if you make this symplectic form a multiple of this one that's not equal to one, uh, you get a much more complicated topology. The rational cohomology has been computed by Abreu and McDuff. Um, and it turns out it's a polynomial ring in four generators. And one of them kind of uh, jumps degree up by four every time the multiple you put here crosses an integer. So these can uh, do strange things. Now, what's, what's one interesting source of uh, symplectomorphisms? Manifold? Suppose we've got some family of smooth varieties and they're polarized so you have some relatively ample line bundle on this guy. In this situation, we have a, a monodromy map from pi 1 of the base with base point at B. into the symplectic mapping class group of the fiber over B, where this omega B comes from the polarization. So given an ample line bundle, you can embed your fiber in some projective space, and then you can pull back the Fubini study form to get a Kähler form, which is an example of a symplectic form. Um, so, for example, uh, we saw this in Mac's talk. Um, if you, if B has is a punctured disk, and we can fill in the puncture with a variety with a node, then this monodromy gives us the Dane twist in the vanishing cycle associated to that node. And Mark talked about this in, in his talk. So the question is, how much of this symplectic mapping class group can we see using monodromy? Like if you take some kind of universal B in whatever sense, um, you know, can you maybe see all of this or can you see 
What, what can you see of this? I mean, you, it's certainly crazy to expect to see all of it because somehow the, the world of algebraic geometry is much more rigid than this kind of, certainly than the world of smooth diffeomorphisms. So, you know, somehow this, this looks a lot bigger, this symplectic mapping class group. I do allow a disk below, yeah. So it's only analysis, but also when you what the treatment is uh, there. Yes. Um, okay. So uh, using these kinds of ideas, Paul Seidel has constructed lots of interesting big subgroups of the symplectic mapping class group. Um, and in that vein, the theorem I want to state is that there exists K3 surface with a Kähler form on it. There exist infinitely many Kähler forms that make it work. Um, such that we have an infinitely generated free group sitting inside the symplectic Torelli group of this uh, K3 equipped with this Kähler form. So, Is it a uh, not not necessarily. No, the, uh, yeah. In fact, the we we there's a certain um, space of Kähler forms we look at, and it's exactly the most irrational ones inside that space that we. Uh, are able to say this about. And how does the proof look? Well, Sorry, what plane is F infinity again? Uh, infinitely generated free group. Countably, Countably infinite, yes. Um, And how does the proof look? Well, we realize this as uh, the fundamental group of the upper half plane minus an infinite set of points. And we use a monodromy construction to get this map into the symp symplectic Torelli group. And then we look at the action of this group on the Fukaya category of X equipped with this form. So this is a certain invariant of our symplectic manifold, uh, which is a category, and elements of the symplectic mapping class group act by autoequivalences of this category. We equate this Yes. And the way we understand this thing that a priori looks pretty complicated is we say by homological mirror symmetry, we're able to equate, I should really have put a put, uh, derived there. We're able to equate this guy with the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on some mirror variety. And now the actual heavy lifting in the theorem has been done by a work of Bridgeland and 
uh, later Bayer and Bridgeland, where they actually computed what this autoequivalence group looks like, and you can take some subgroup of it that you denote like this, Kalabi Yao autoequivalences that act trivially on homology, and then this is actually an isomorphism. So, you know, this is the stuff we've, we've really done. We've done this mirror symmetry statement. Yep. This is what we've done. We've matched up these two categories, and we also had to check this diagram commutes. And then the real hard work is done by Bayer and Bridgeland showing that this is, I, I should have quotiented by shifts here, sorry. Uh, showing this as an isomorphism. Um, so is it like in all the all the uh, all the L's of this diagram are isomorphic? No, very much not. This this is something we really don't know how much extra stuff it could have in it. What it tells us is we know what it tells us is but the, the computation of the two is an Correct. So what it tells us is that this thing is some semi-direct product of this infinitely generated free group with the kernel of this thing, the things that act trivially on the Fukaya category. Sorry, I'm over time, I should stop. Yep.